Hi everyone, this is Ken Solstice again for uh, Psychology 370, uh, Psychological Assessment, Methods of Psychological Assessment. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about reliability. So I wanted to start off and talk a little bit about what reliability is. Let me just say right at the very beginning that your textbook has about a jillion different uh, definitions for reliability. And so I'm going to go through these. I don't want to confuse you. You've all probably been around psychology long enough now to know that there are sometimes ideas and concepts that just have different um, different definitions, different ways of talking about them. So we're going to get to a final definition in a few slides here, but let's just talk a little bit about some of what we mean when we talk about reliability, especially in, in terms of measurement. One way of thinking about this would be consistency of measurement, being able to consistently measurement measure something using a psychological test or psychological measure. Another way of thinking about this, and this is a, a definition that comes from your textbook, uh, would be the degree to which test scores are free from error of measurement. We're going to talk a little bit more in a minute about error of measurement, but in general, error is when something isn't right. And so we want our scores to be reliable, meaning that we want them not to have a lot of errors in them. Uh, another way of thinking about this from your textbook says the extent to which an instrument, a psychological measure, yields consistent reproducible estimates of what is assumed to be an underlying true score. And so the idea here is that when we're measuring a quality in somebody, there's a, a score that would act accurately indicate what that person's uh, ability is, what to what degree they have a certain quality if we were measuring personality um, constructs, that sort of thing. And so we want to see that we're getting the true score and that we're getting that in a consistent way that we can reproduce that result over time. Uh, that kind of leads into the next, um, uh, the next statement about reliability would be that we can think about reliability as the extent to which a measure performs similarly with repeated administrations and or multiple raters. So what that means is if we've got a test, we want it to act the same way every time we use it, no matter who gives it. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about some aspects of that in a minute. Another way of thinking about reliability is that reliability determines whether the variability in scores is a result of measurement error or true differences among participants in the quality being measured. So again, we want to know, um, ideally when we're giving a measure, when we're doing a test, we want to see difference in scores. That's in our research, for those of you that are doing your, your uh, thesis or, or thinking about your thesis for next year, you don't want all of the scores, say you're doing a study of depression, you don't want everyone in your study to come back with the same level of depressive symptomatology because that means that your independent variables didn't have any effect on your dependent variables. You want to see variability on those dependent uh, variable measures. And so what, one of the things reliability helps us to do is it helps us to know whether the variability that we see in scores, is that really because there, there are true differences among the people who participated in our test or is it because there's some sort of error that's making everybody's scores look a little different? Um, one thing I wanted to mention, this is uh, just sort of important again, especially if you're thinking about thesis or other kinds of research, reliability tends to be less stable for personality measures than for intelligence. And the reason for this is because personality tends to fluctuate. It fluctuates a little bit based on how we're feeling for the day. You know. Uh, for a lot of us, some days we're very nice, but every once in a while we have a day where we're just sort of grumpy and mean and, and not nice to be around. And so that's going to fluctuate more than our intelligence, which really doesn't go up and down much from day to day. Unfortunately, some of us would like to be a little more intelligent some days than others, but uh, it just doesn't work that way. Okay, so a little bit more about what is reliability. Reliability helps us to determine how trustworthy or accurate as a test is. And so how much can we trust this test that we're using? Also, re reliability is related to validity. And we're going to talk more about validity next week. But a simple definition for validity is that validity is the degree to which a test measures what it's designed to measure. So a measure can be rely reliable, but it could be reliable, but not valid. But it can never be valid, but not reliable. And I will say there's a little bit of controversy about that with people that are doctoral level researchers. But in general, just remember, if something is valid, it has to be reliable. But if it's reliable, it's not necessarily valid. And let me explain what I mean. If you went over to um, over to Michelson uh, and, and you were in the, uh, the, the gym there, the workout room, and you wanted to uh, measure your weight and 
let's say that the scale, you got on the scale there, and the scale is five kilograms wrong. So the scale says 65 kilograms, and you're really 70 kilograms. Every time you get on that scale until it's fixed, so every time, unless it's fixed, every time you get on that scale, it's going to say 65 kilograms. So it's going to be reliable. It's going to give you the same result every time, but it's not a valid measure of your weight. That measure isn't really measuring your weight. Hopefully that makes sense. It's so hard doing these video lectures. I can't see your faces. I can't see if I've got light bulbs or if I've got blank, blank stares coming from you. But hopefully that makes sense. As always, if there's any of this that doesn't make sense, please email me, guys. Um, if you're really stuck, I can even do a Skype call with you and we can talk more about any of this that's confusing. So we finally, three slides in, four slides in, we come to a definition of reliability. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to use the definition from your book's glossary, from the little dictionary at the back of your book. And so the textbook that we're using for this class says that reliability is consistency, or you might think of dependability of scores over time, meaning that if we give a test today and then we give it next week, we're going to get similar results. Between raters, meaning whoever scores the test, we're going to have similar results. Uh, that we're going uh, that no matter what the scores are or the forms that are used or the content in the test, we're going if, if that stays the same, we're going to have consistency and, and dependability. So that's a simple definition, but that's what um, that's what you want to remember if you just need sort of a quick, easy definition of reliability. So all the other things I said in the last few slides play into it, but this is really uh, kind of the, the crux of, of what reliability is. Okay, so one of the things that makes um, reliability difficult to ascertain is this idea of error. Um, and this makes it really difficult to, to, um, to know whether a measure is reliable or not, or this is the thing that makes it difficult to, to understand that. Um, one thing that we need to do if we're trying to understand reliability is that we need to be able to separate measurement error from somebody's true score. Uh, so all measurement has some error, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but um, there are some types of measures that have less error than others. So objective measures, and by that we mean measures that aren't really interpreted by a psychologist, by the person giving the test, they tend to have less error. So things like Likert scales, multiple choice tests, um, there's just less error because there's no interpretation. But some of the projective measures, for example, some of the, I'm sorry, some of the subjective measures, for example, projective tests, things like the Rorschach ink block test or the thematic apperception test, the TAT, they tend to have more error because there's a need for somebody to interpret them. And anytime we get human interpretation in there, we likely generate some error because we might see something differently than what it was meant to be or what um, we might score something differently than what the true score would be. So the simple formula uh, to calculate error is X, which would be the observed score, um, the score that we get when we actually give the test. That observed score is equal to the true score plus the error. So um, that's maybe one way to think about it mathematically. The problem is we can never really calculate um, can never really calculate a score that way because we never know what the true score is. We only have the observed score. So um, that's maybe a way to think about it mathematically, but not a lot of practical help there. One of the concepts that's, that we can measure is what's called the standard error of measurement. And this is a little bit confusing. Some people get it confused with standard deviation. So I wanted to take a minute and just explain what the standard error of measurement is. So SEM is the abbreviation. And you want to be careful here because sometimes SEM is also used for structural equation modeling, which is something totally different. It's a statistical procedure, sometimes used in path analysis and that sort of thing. But uh, SEM is something, uh, when, when we're talking about structural equation modeling, that's something totally different than standard error of measurement. So standard error of measurement this is the, uh, this is the uh, measurement of the amount of error in a particular score on a test. So this is related to reliability, and it's actually related mathematically to reliability. So SEM equals the standard deviation um, times the square root of 1 minus the reliability coefficient. And so what that means, I'm not going to ask you to figure any of that out by hand or anything. I don't think that's terribly helpful. What that really means in layperson's terms or in, you know, bachelor's degree terms is that the higher the reliability is, 
the lower the standard measurement of error is because that um, that reliability coefficient is part of the of the equation. We want to have higher reliability. That means that our likelihood of having error is less. Um, so the other reason SEM is important is that it's used to calculate uh, confidence bands or confidence intervals. Um, so 68% of the time, uh, a participant's true score will be within one standard uh, standard error of measurement unit of the observed score. This sort of works like standard deviation. So 95% um, of the time, it's within two SEM units, and 99% of the time, it's within three SEM units. Let me give you an example of this, and this is from the textbook. So if you're a little confused, um, go back and read uh, read the textbook, and that will uh, read this part again, and that that should help you understand this. So if we're using the the, West, the Wexler intelligence test, um, and let's say somebody takes that test and they get an IQ score of 100, which would be average. That would be an average score, kind of right in right in the middle of average or right about average. Um, and for the Wexler, the SEM, the standard, uh, standard error of measurement is three. So what that means is that somebody with a score of 100 on the test, we could, we could say that 68% of the time, they're going to score between 97 and 103. Uh, and so you can see what we did is we just um, subtracted and added that SEM unit of three to the person's score of 100. So if we do that one time, that gives us 97 to 103. If we take um, two SEMs off, we get down to 94. If we add two on, we get up to 106. And so the idea is that we would score, um, that our, our, our imaginary person would score between 94 and 106, 95% of the time. And then they'd score between 91 and 109, 99% of the time. And what we did there is we just took that SEM score of three and multiplied it by three. And we did 99% of all scores are going to be within three SEM units of the person's uh, observed score on a test. So why is this important? Uh, we don't do this, uh, you know, obviously a lot, in a lot of ways, this maybe isn't something we use a lot, but where this becomes important is that APA now recommends that we, we report confidence intervals when we write research articles. And so this might very well be something you need to do in your thesis. And so a lot of times we use a 95% confidence interval. And so within the example I've given, the 95% confidence interval would be, uh, this would be the idea that somebody's got a score uh, that almost every time they take the test, 95% of the times they take the test, their score would be between 94 and 106. Um, so what we could do in our, you know, in our thesis, if we're doing something like that, is report the 95% confidence interval. And then we kind of know that if somebody, if somebody comes and takes that test and they get 115, we know that there's something going on. Either that for, first score wasn't really an accurate score of their ability, it wasn't really an accurate measure of their ability, or something a little funky happened the second time around. But when we know, when they're outside of that three, uh, that 99% confidence interval, or even the 95% confidence interval, we often start to start to question uh, how how reliable is this instrument that we're using. Again, hopefully that makes sense. That's just an example, maybe to help you understand it better. Again, the book also has a good discussion of this. If you get stuck, please look at that again. A little bit of additional information uh, that I wanted to put here. Sometimes we hear about false negatives or po false positives. Uh, and these are pretty much just what they sound like. A false negative is when somebody gets a score lower than it should have been based on their knowledge or based on the, the characteristics that they hold. False positive is just the opposite. This is when they score higher than they should have. Um, and so, you know, we all sort of want false positives, right? You'd like to get a better score on the test than what you really deserve. Um, but unfortunately for a lot of us, especially if it's a test of knowledge, um, uh, a lot of times uh, the false positives don't come our way very often. Okay, one other thing we should mention is standard error of, the, of difference. I'm not gonna um, uh, talk about this a whole lot, but SED is a statistical procedure used to evaluate whether scores are significantly different from each other. And this would be used in um, things like learning disability testing and that kind of thing. Okay, some factors that affect reliability. And I wanted to just summarize some of these. Um, one of these is content familiarity. And so this is sort of obvious, you know, if you 
if you uh, are familiar with the contents of a test, that test is going to be a more reliable measure of what you know or what you can do. Um, and sometimes this isn't just the uh, where this becomes a reliability issue, especially is when the content isn't the content that you're familiar with um, may or may not always be related to what the test is measuring. And so the book gives an example of one of the authors who took a test where they had to um, complete various analogies, but a lot of the terms uh, that the analogies were written in were from were from fencing and ballet. And so if you're not familiar with fencing and ballet, that test may not be a reliable measure of your ability to complete analogies, um, just as an example. Another factor that affects reliability is diversity among test takers. Um, and, uh, you know, an example here would be if I gave uh, if I gave all of you a psychological measure that was de designed for um, people your age, but people your age from China, you may not do as well on that. that. That may not be a reliable measure for you. There may be something um, going on with you that makes that test not reliable um, the way it would be for uh, a Chinese student. Test length can also affect reliability, and generally we think a longer test is more reliable because there's going to be more content sampling. We can simply fit more into a longer test, and so there's more of a chance that we're going to cover all the content that we need to cover in that test, and that test will be a better, um, you know, will we'll perform, perform better over time because we can be more sure that it's testing everything we want to be testing. Uh, guessing can also affect the reliability of tests, and longer tests are less sensitive to guessing. If you have a 10-item test and you know six items and you guess on a few, you might easily get an 80 or 90 percent on that test just by getting a few lucky guesses. But on a longer test, a few lucky guesses aren't necessarily going to raise your grade that much or raise your score that much. And so guessing can have, a, have an effect on reliability, especially for shorter tests. Uh, this one's sort of simplistic or sort of obvious, but uh, the clarity of directions. If you don't understand what you're supposed to do on a test, that test may not perform reliably. And this sounds simple, but I've been amazed at the times that maybe somebody will give an instrument and they don't have an explanation of which direction their Likert scale runs. So you don't know whether one or five is, is sort of the high or the strongly agree for your Likert scale. That obviously has big effects on reliability. Item construction, uh, how the items are put together, how, how the test is constructed, this makes a difference. And I've already, I've already discussed the differences in reliability between objective versus subjective items. Test difficulty, and this is sort of interesting because um, reliability is, is difficult to test if we have very difficult or very easy tests. If a test is very, very difficult, everyone's score tends to cluster on the low side and so that, that makes it hard to see that variability to see whether the test performs the way that it's supposed to perform. Um, test taker heterogeneity, what that means is just how similar are the test takers to each other. And so if, if a group of test takers are very similar to each other, or we'd say homogenous, uh, sort of like with the difficult test, that might lower variability. If everybody that takes the test is pretty similar to each other, we may, we may not see a lot of difference between scores. That makes it harder to calculate reliability. Um, time intervals between tests. Uh, if, we're, if we want to see if a test performs the same way across repeated uses or repeated administrations, the shorter the amount of time we have between the tests, the more reliable it's going to be. Um, and that sort of makes sense, right? If I take the test again next week as opposed to next year, I'm going to remember more of the test. I'm probably going to perform more similarly on it. Test taking conditions definitely make a difference. Some of this is beyond our control as psychologists. We can't always, we can't always um, affect or change the environmental conditions a person's taking a test in. But for example, if, um, if you're in a room taking a test, taking a, you know, completing a psychological measure, and um, somebody's outside trimming trees with an electric saw, that noise is going to be certain, uh, distracting to a certain number of people. That might affect how the test performs, and it might not be a problem with the test, but the test might still come out less reliable than it should. Test taker characteristics also make a difference. Um, these are things like personality, stress level, health, emotional well-being. Um, obviously, if I'm stressed out and depressed, I'm probably not going to do as well on a test 
and that's going to affect uh, how the test performs in terms of reliability. Um, the, the last thing that uh, we should talk about in terms of factors that affect reliability would be speededness or whether we, whether we put people in a situation where they need to complete the test within a time limit. If we put a time limit on a test, it seems like that lowers reliability because people don't tend to do as well on that test. We may not get a true score. We may have more error in that, uh, in that observed score. Obviously, when we're developing an instrument, a, a measure, uh, as you guys are going to do later this semester, uh, when I'm there in person, I'm going to help you get started with developing a measure, and that's going to be the final part of this class is you working in groups to develop a measure. Obviously, there are some things you can control and some things you can't. So you can control the time interval between the tests. If you decide to give your test two different times, um, you can control the time interval. You may not always be able to control the environmental conditions. You might not be able to control, for example, if LCC has a construction project going on that causes a lot of noise right outside the window where you're giving your test to your, to your pilot group. Um, you can't control the person who's taking the test, their stress levels, their emotions that day. So some things we can control, we want to control those. Other things may introduce air in and may lower our reliability, and there may not be much we can do about that. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the different types of reliability. Um, one type of reliability, and we've already sort of alluded to this, would be inter-rater inter reliability. And so this is the idea that does the test perform the same way no matter who gives the test? Obviously, this is going to be more of an issue with subjective tests, right? You know, if I give a multiple choice test, it probably doesn't matter who gives you that test. But if I'm doing something like the TAT or the Rorschach, that may, very, that may be very affected by the person giving the test. I may interpret what someone says differently than another psychologist would. Um, an example of this from more the clinical side of psychology, uh, years and years ago, um, when the DSM-2 was still around, we're up to the DSM-5 now, so this was before the 1980s, this would have been the 1970s and beyond, there was a real problem in psychiatry because, and psychology because people would go to two or three different psychologists or psychiatrists, they would get two or three different diagnoses. And so one person might say they were they had major depressive disorder, one person might say bipolar disorder, another person might say um, um, dystymic disorder, a milder form of depression. And one of the things that happened was the public got very concerned about, and this was in the US, the public in the US got very concerned about do these people even know what they're doing? Because there was an inter rater reliability. They were all using the same diagnostic criteria, but they were all interpreting those criteria differently. And so that's an example of a time when inter rater reliability wasn't very good. And so the DSM-3, the DSM-4, the DSM-5 were actually developed uh, in such a way as to make the criteria more clear. If you've, if you've had your psychopathology class, you'll know something about this to make the uh, diagnostic criteria more clear so that we had better inter-rater reliability. And they actually did tests with this, you know, so when they were developing the criteria, they'd give it to, to different people, have them see a standardized client, somebody who came in and said the exact same thing, and they'd make sure that the different raters, the different interviewers, um, diagnosed them with a similar disorder. Another type of reliability is test-retest reliability. And this is what we talked about a moment ago, where if you develop a measure and you give it to a group of people one day, and then you give it to another to the same group of people another day, whether that's a day later, a week later, a year later, and you want to see whether that test performs the same time or, or performs similarly that second time that you administer it. Now there are some other things that affect this. There's there's just maturation and normal development. So if I give a child a test of um, critical thinking skills uh, when he's seven, and I give it again when he's ten there's going to be natural maturation that happens over time. Uh, they're going to be better critical thinkers uh, at 10 than at 7. And so the test may look like it's not reliable because it's going to perform differently, but that difference in performance may be because the person's matured or developed. A similar issue would be practice or carryover effects. If we do the same test multiple times, sometimes we just get better at it. And so it might not be that our knowledge has changed, but there might be what we call a research or testing effect, where there's something about that test or using the test multiple times that actually actually affects the score and makes it look less reliable than what it is. Another type of reliability is internal consistency. 
And this is calculated statistically, and here we want to see the degree to which each item in the test is correlated to other items and to the total score. And so what we don't want is items that aren't really correlated to each other, because then we get the sense, well, they're not really all measuring the same thing. So if we have 10 questions and we're trying to measure depression, and we want to make a depression scale where you add it up, you get a depression score. If nine of those items are really strongly intercorrelated and one doesn't correlate very well at all, we start to think, well, that one item that isn't correlated very well, it's not really consistent because it doesn't seem to be measuring the same thing the other items are measuring. So that's what we mean when we say internal consistency. Split half reliability, this is a way to test reliability where we take a test and we split it in half and we correlate one half to the other. Now, one of the problems with this is how do we split the test in half in a random way? And some people take the first half versus the last half of the test. Um, other people will split it even in odd um, items. But what we're doing, again, is just using a correlation to examine how one half of the test fits, how closely related it is to the other half of the test. Another way, or another, yeah, another type of reliability, another way we can evaluate reliability is what's called alternative form reliability. This one's also correlation based. And so here we'd be looking at if I give a person one version of a test and I give them a second version of the test, do they perform in similar ways on both versions of the test? This can be as simple as just changing the numbering uh, for the items on the test so that they're in a different order. Or it can be as elaborate as having parallel forms. And we see this sometimes with the standardized tests. Like in the US, um, before you go to college, students take usually one of two standardized tests. One would be the Scholastic Aptitude Test, the SAT. And there, you might have everybody taking the SAT on the same day. They may have a different version of the SAT than the people that take the SAT the next week. And so the idea is that that test should give a similar score of their ability to do well in college but it's going to be a different form of the same test. It's not going to have the same questions on it. And so we want to see there, do those, SA, do those administrations of the SAT, do those parallel forms, those alternate forms, do they perform similar, similarly to each other in terms of the scores that they generate? OK, just a little bit about some of the statistical procedures that we use um, to calculate reliability. And this will be important. When I'm in Clipit, I'm planning to show you how to do some of these using SPSS. Some of you probably already know, um, if you're working on your dissertation, you might already be looking at this. I'm sorry, on your thesis, you might already be looking at this. But if not, uh, yeah, I'll show you. And for those of you that do know how, it'll just be good review. So one of the statistical procedures that we use quite a lot, and I'm sure you all learned about this when you were learning statistics. I know you all had a statistics class. Um, the Pearson correlation co coefficient, or R. Um, R would be the, the sort of the abbreviation we use for that. And this is just, this, uh, this statistic just measures the degree of linear relationship between two variables. So this is the standard thing if we want to see um, is wealth related to um, um, size of the house one lives in. And so our hypothesis would probably be that as wealth increases, the size of one house in square meters increases. And so um, we might say there we've got a strong positive correlation. That might be correlated at the 0.4 level, 0.5. That would be a pretty strong positive correlation. We could also have a negative correlation if we wanted to look at, um, oh, I don't know, something like um, years of education and um, risk for involvement in illegal drug use. We might, we might hypothesize that somebody who has more years of education is less likely to get into illegal drug use, and there we'd have a negative correlation. Um, so as years of, of uh, education increased, year, uh, amount of drugs used would decrease, uh, if our hypothesis is correct. Uh, we don't use the Pearson correlation a lot in testing for reliability, although we can. We do use it to test the alternative form reliability. But there are three other tests that we use more to look at, at reliability. The Spear and Brown coefficient is used to look at split half and parallel form reliability. The Cooter Richardson correlation, or the KR20, is used to look at internal consistency. And this is especially used um, for. Um, tests that have, a, have items that only have two possible answers. Cronbach's alpha, you might also hear, hear this called, uh, it's also known as coefficient alpha. This is probably the most common measure of reliability 
And this also is a measure of internal consistency, but it's used with um, tests of items with more than, more than just two responses. Um, these correlation coefficients, Pearson's doesn't work this way, but for the most part, um, the correlation coefficients range from zero, range from zero to 1.0. And so here's how we interpret uh, the reliability uh, coefficients. Um, if the coefficient is around 0 0.90, and I put 0 0.90-ish, you know, 0 0.91, something like that, we usually say that it's excellent. We usually say that reliability is excellent. If it's 0.80 to 0.89, it would be good. 0.70 to 0.79 is adequate. 0.60 to 0.69 is their sort of limited utility or acceptability. Below 0.6, we usually say it's unacceptable. There's two things I want to say about this, though, and they're not really, uh, the book doesn't really cover both of these. There are some differences of opinion among statisticians and researchers on this issue. So I have seen um, scales like this that say anything below 0.70, you shouldn't use. Um, there's other people that say anything between 0.6 and 0.7 is okay. Um, so I kind of just tried to give you an overview based on what the book says, but you may read an article somewhere that says something different. What you want to do if you run into this, say you're doing your thesis and you find that one of the instruments you used uh, has a Cronbox alpha of 0.62. What you want to do is you want to cite something in your, in your thesis that says, um, this author says that 0.62 is acceptable but low reliability. And usually that'll be enough. I think I actually had to do that in my doctoral dissertation even um, for one of my measures. Uh, so it's just good to kind of back up what you're doing with somebody else's, um, somebody else's opinion when that, that other person ideally would be, would be an expert. So don't cite me, but cite your textbook in that case. The other thing I wanted to mention is your, your book doesn't say this, but it's important. There's a problem if we get coefficients that are too far above 0 0.90, because this is all based on correlation. And so one of our concerns is if everything is correlated at the 0.99 level, uh, do we really need 10 different items measuring depression? If they're all that strongly correlated, they might all be measuring the same aspect of depression. So ideally, we want the different items on our measures to not be completely intercorrelated with each other. We want them to have a strong correlation, but we don't want that to be a perfect correlation. Or we start to think, hey, this, those items, there's different questions. They're probably all asking the same thing, just asking it in a slightly different way. And that's not really helpful. And the people taking your test aren't going to like that. So they're going to be like, hey, they just asked me the same question 20 different ways. Okay, so that's the end of this week's lecture. As always, please make sure that you um, that you complete the quiz uh, online after this, uh, after you've watched this video lecture and after you've read the, the textbook chapter. Um, also, as I said earlier in the, um, in the lecture, please do send me an email. Let me know if there's anything you're not clear on. Um, I'd be glad to talk, uh, talk that through with you or send you an email about it to try to explain it further. Hope you're all doing well. Um, I saw online this week uh, that it's snowing in Klaipeda. I hope you're all staying warm. Really looking forward to seeing you all when I when I get to Klaipeda in March. I looked through my class list and saw that I know a number of you, either from uh, having you in class or meeting you through the psychology club that we had when I was there. So just really excited to catch up with all of you again. Hope you're doing well. Hope your semester's going well. And I'll talk to you again next week. Bye now.